Hi guys, hello, man. I'm here to It's Michelle Marie Tony. This is the big one. I told you about this. Um, I'm a nervous wreck. <laughs> and that is, is I finally was able to contact James Farrell, the author of the book, um, Era Hell. Are he led? Um, book six, The Road Man. He's uh, already let me know that the first three of the series sold out. and uh, This is volume three. That's the only copy I have at the moment. Okay, um, let me give you a little background about this guy here, as far as I understand here. It says here, James is a local stonemason, farmer, and writer in Northwest Connecticut. He has construct he's constructed mythologies for New England and red um, redacted both Norse and Finnish mythologies, along as many literary undertakings. Currently, his written works total 100 through this number will likely change or as the years get past. Homeschooled, he is known to local children as the wizard and is chiefly renowned for being the only person in town that wears a straw hat in summer. Okay, that's what you said at the time the book was published. Um, it's true enough for the most part. Okay, well, let's uh, one, one to get to know a little bit about you versus the background because this is really a very unusual opportunity for me. I don't usually get a chance to interview people, and it really is uh, really exciting because I'm also uh, have tried writing too, but unfortunately, I have never had much luck doing it. So let's start with first. So, what about your background? Since you you're homeschooled, I I was I was mainstream. Was I went to school um, originally? A little bit about me. I was actually. Born and raised in East Hartland for the first six years of my life. Then we moved to Winst, um, New Hartford from 1976 to 1983. And then I moved from New Hartford to Winstead in 1983. And then for a while I went, I, and I was from 83 to 93. And then I moved to Willamette and in Connecticut where I got, was went to school. And then I moved back to Winstead, um, after briefly going to Goshen, uh, let's put it this way. I've been bouncing back and forth for like a vibrating... Homeschooling usually means that one is educated at home. Usually, right. Usually the reasons for this is because the parents do not trust the public school system to provide an adequate education. Right. And my experience is that the people that are turned out by the current school system are, as was demonstrated in the first book of this volume, right. pretty much trash. And what about what about parochial the, schools? Well, the first I know very little about parochial schools. I haven't often met the products of parochial schools, but they seem better. Mm -hmm. on the I whole. know uh, they seem more courteous, more well behaved. However, the homeschoolers have a distinct. When you meet a homeschooler, you can usually tell him by the fact that he has manners and culture. That's been my experience as a whole. Right. Whereas you can usually tell a public schooler by the fact that only occasionally does he have manners and culture. You know, that brings a very good question. Um, um, that, was one, that was one of the main things I wanted to cover in the first book right. of this volume. is because it was pretty much summing up what I observed in the local youth of Winstead in the year 2011. Well, you know, it's funny you mentioned because, um, like I said, I mean, I lived in Winstead in 2011. Too. I mean, I moved back to Winstead from Torrington about 2006. Uh... Yeah, let's just say 2006. I kind of lost track. It's been a long time. Um, and I I went to Gilbert School. I went to the Gilbert School and I was my high school my freshman year. Uh, and I know what you're talking about with the kids. <laughs> yeah, second. So um, Even though when you went to school, it was a long time ago. They've worsened since. Oh, I know that. But they've gotten worse all over the country since. Actually, they've gotten worse in the last five years, even since this book was written. You know, that brings an interesting question. You mentioned something in that book. I want to ask you if you potentially believe it, because I think you do deep down. Is that if there's some kind of a force, or uh, like you suggest in the book, uh, as Willow Fox's character is, it just went along with uh, Arthur, that may have been some kind of a spiritual fog of vapor that's kind of entering in. A mental fog. Yeah, something that's causing behavioral changes. Yes, it's actually, I think that's, I intended that to be an observation of what I believe to be a literal fact. Yeah. It sums up a lot of the behavior I've observed. Yeah, you know, I think, I think that the thing is, is that 
I see it all around me because I am the North American circle and I'm with the sorceress. It's like the it's like the entire world is slowly going insane. Yeah, exactly. But let me ask you a question now. So you call you the wizard, so um, do you have any knowledge of um, both the light and the dark forces? Do you have any? I am actually a Roman Catholic. I suspected as much. I am and too. And a devout yeah. Roman Catholic. I However, am Roman the, Catholic. I'm a priest of Well, Bacon. the practice of, of Roman Catholicism is incompatible with the practice of any kind of sorcery, witchcraft, or magic. It does make it a little bit difficult. Yeah. And you know what the problem is, is when they changed the Mass this time in 2000 and... What was it? 2000? 2011? Yeah. They changed... November of 2011 They changed liturgy enough now. that I went into Mass... Um, a couple of months ago, it was like, so the what? <laughs> the language has gotten more solemn and more exalted. Yeah, but then again, like I said, closer to the original. I was looking in the pew for um, for a copy of the missal because usually it was one, and there wasn't any. Well, uh, the, I sat there and I was. It's I, actually it's the dark, it's the pale or green one that's called Journey Songs. That's where the readings are. Right, right. I think they're in the. Um, but, I mean, the funny thing is, is that, Later like part. I said, I went in there, and, I mean, it's a step of, it's, a, it's, a, it's only Latin is the step beyond this, okay? And then it's like, I happen to have a copy of the Missal in Latin. And I'm like, here I am, um, looking at the English and Latin translation, uh, of course, that's for the high mass, this is the low mass. I sat there, I'm like, uh, okay, I know the part where the Lord and not worthy to receive you under my roof. But I understood that part, because that's exactly what it says in Latin. But yet, the thing was, is, and the same thing was, and with your spirit. That's also the original literal translation of the Latin from the Tridentine Mass. From the, from the Missa Romanium. Ecum Spirito to O. Right. But the thing was, is what threw me was, is, because of my hearing loss in part, I was mm. like, I went in there, it was like, it felt like, you might as well be speaking, you might as well be speaking Yiddish. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> Well, stand and sit when the people around you are standing and sitting. And That's then usually the best way to And then, of course, I went up to receive. And, 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 and if the priest says, enough, he said, are you Catholic? I said, yes, I'm Catholic, but Father, I haven't been in this church in so long. <laughs> well, then you can't receive communion, I'm afraid. I could, because I did do a perfect contrition. But it was still... Well, you actually was, you have to go to was, confession. It has to be official. Yes, I know. It was. I, just, I was just making sure you know that... You're not, because that is the actual flesh and blood of Christ. That's as, right. As a result, if you receive it unworthily, then you are eating and drinking your own condemnation. That's what St. Paul says. That's right. Yeah, I know that. And and the thing is, is that most people don't. Because if you listen to a lot of the people who, the various traditions, um, like the, the Episcopal Church, for example, does to communion, but they say it's, uh, in some parishes they'll say it's, this is a symbol. This exactly. is a metaphor. They don't quite believe it's in not the a metaphor. Presence. That is literally the body and blood of Christ. Um, of course, in the Episcopal churches, it isn't because the Episcopal churches have invalid ordination. Right. And the chain was broken at the time of the Reformation because they used an invalid formula in consecrating their new priests, with the result that no priest of the ordination actually occurred, and they were just ministers or pastors. Right. I mean, they can admin, they can preach the word of but God, you gotta understand but they can't, they can't is, consecrate the body and blood of Christ. But you got to understand, as well as I do, is that Henry VIII wasn't exactly too fond of Rome, especially nope. since he would not um, All right, give him an annulment. But back on topic, you were to, you wanted to ask me questions about the Roadsman? Okay. Yeah, I wanted to ask you something about the Roadsman, too. Let's get back to that. You're right. I tend to... <laughs> I know. Okay. Yes. Okay. Where did you come up with the idea for the Roadsman? It sort of occurred to me. The the Rhodes man himself, I sort of got the idea of a mysterious being a mysterious being stopping a school bus and getting on. And the and this being was actually the commander of the Rhodes of New England, the warden of the Rhodes. How did he become that? I mean, maybe it's sort of the the, I, the idea was central. Then I simply developed the image. Okay. And the the entire book of the the part where they go on the mystical realms of the rainbow. That part was intended to bring out all sorts of little hints and riddles in the main series of R.E. Led that hadn't been developed or explained. And so I just listed them out. I says, okay, this loose end hasn't been tied up. This little reference hasn't been clarified. I says, okay, I'll write a book to do them all. 
you know, it's still kind of interesting when you think about you said, because I was around in 2010, some of the events that you mentioned in the book about, uh, of course, we didn't, of course, it is, for a lack of a better terminology, you can call it a historical fiction fantasy. It's not really. It's te- technically, it's epic fantasy. Contemporary fantasy, but epic fantasy. Right. But what's kind of interesting, of course, is we didn't have a massacre in the carnival in 2009. Yep. That's, but I've been in the carnival, I could see where such a thing could really be a real article went to 2011, September 2001. Is it, is the carnival is always packed. We already know that, especially oh, in the yes. second week. I went to the 2011 carnival to sum up its atmosphere. But I noticed that one thing that you mentioned of this, this Roseman, first of all, he's protecting these two characters. Because, first of all, he realized that, number one, is he would normally tell them, well, you could travel my roads, so you protect it. But then he realized that since they were minors, that he couldn't... That's because he believes in parental authority. And these being... This, these being... Right. He's being a half-spiritual character, personality. As a result, minor things like parental authority form physical obstacles to him. So what he did was he came up with a of a protection amulet. Sort of like, it didn't work either. Oh, I didn't get a to that. Right. A Pisonic's dragon ripped it off the chest. Right, well. Oh, you obviously. haven't read it all. Okay. That's, that's no, in all reality. It. That's what happens in real life with a protect amulet is you're always at the risk of losing it. It's just well, like Well, actually, mine. it's not exactly an amulet. It was more like... A, he, he simply took a chunk of the byways and put it on them. That's not technically an amulet. Well, we know what it is. The uh, splinter itself was just a piece of wood. It's but, you didn't actually... Well, I mean, no, you see, the thing is, it had a mystical connection to the fact of the byways. It basically bore his province with them. Right. And therefore he could act where that splinter was. The splinter itself was powerless. In the same manner, the sacramentals of the Catholic Church have a similar principle. Right. Because the scapular or the, or the holy water or the blessed object doesn't actually have any power in and of itself, but it is connected to the church by the blessings, and the church's power is what acts through it. Right. And it was something on those lines. I, I just think it's amazing the lot of imagery that you came through in that book of... Um, it's almost like you crawl through every single one of the hidey holes that you mentioned. I did. I prowled around. I noticed a great many things. I've never seen the swamp you're talking about, but I certainly would like to see it. <laughs> well, all you have to do is go up Cornelio Place, go right. to the end, and follow the path into the woods. Oh, okay. I think I know where it is now. Yep, that's where it is. But as far as the old abandoned house on Church Hill, I've never seen that one. Let's see, the abandoned house on Church Hill. What you talked that? about a house that was an old house. Was oh, the of... graveyard? Yeah. The grave house? The, um, that's near the... Actually, that's near the graveyard just outside the window. Okay. It's the spooky looking house and the one just across from it under the pines. Okay. Those I, two houses. I know that the, one of the houses was just recently restored. Yeah, that's, paint. that's the one that I called the haunted house. That's because back in the old days it was kind of scary. The... Well, actually, there was a girl I knew who lived in that house, and she could see ghosts, and she claimed to have seen several ghosts in that house. Well, Admittedly, of... I have only her word for it, but... A lot of one says I was houses. basing... Um... Admitted, I have only her word for it, but I was basing... I was using that in the mythology. Right. I mean, because the witch has a lot of old houses and stuff. I mean, this building here is... I got ghosts in this building, too. I, I see them, but... You know, on end part, I think that the scariest thing I ever ran into was it was a negative entity that came into my apartment one time. And me and Lemmy had to chase him out. That scared me, but I was like, I knew what to do. I grabbed that pentacle off the wall and I said, by the powers of the Blessed Virgin Mother, get the heck out. Um, that guy jumped through, well, this... that spirit jumped through that wall so fast. A pentacle so would not have the slightest effect. A pentacle is a magic symbol. It's a magic symbol, but it's if you notice that mine, unlike the satanic one, um, the main spiritual point, the point is up, because it's always aims towards. That makes not the slightest difference. By being a magical symbol, it may symbol, not make a much of a devil. difference, but of course, it. You know, I understand the meaning of what it represents the five elementals, and the meaning may be the meaning is not exactly the same as what it does, because you see the thing is when a thing. When a symbol is used for magic practices, it loses all its former associations and becomes solely and simply a tie and a bond to the devil. I, I don't know. I, let's just the agree. Thing is, it, what I mean is it can no longer licitly be used by Catholic men. Well, I mean, in that The pentangle case... originally originated as a Catholic expression of symbology, but then the witches took it and used it as their symbol. 
and accordingly we Catholics can no longer make licit use of it. What I've ever sensed is is like on an um um. I know what it's. I know what it's said to represent. Right. But what it represents is irrelevant to what it actually is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because what it represents has long since been taken away from it. What it is now is it is used as a magic symbol, and when you use a magic symbol that has been used by demons, then you are basically connecting to them. Okay, so let's just bring this back. You're kind of bit, you're basically kind of getting in danger of poison. You know what I mean? It's kind of like spiritual poison. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. like if a devil happens to touch something, he leaves a poison on it. Now, if you happen to touch that something, you might or might not get poison from it. It's kind of like that. Right. That's what I mean. Okay, so let's talk about the, the, the characters now. Obviously, so, so I've obviously got part where the piece of wood was given to them. Uh, I haven't gotten further than that yet. I mean, I'm still chewing through it, so, you know, bear with me. Um, what, in, okay, so you start writing these series. You mentioned the first three books sold out. Do you ever think they're going to be making another reprinting of those? Well, it's not exactly a reprinting. I self-published them on CreateSpace. And I ordered right. some copies to sell here, and so I sold out of the copies I had purchased. Right. Do you plan to be printing any more? Well, as I said, this one here is for sale, if you wanted to buy it. Uh, well, I sell it for $10. As you may know, I but yes, don't I have much money. I know. Okay, now, which book is that one there? That's... This is volume three of the original series. So you, Okay, so those are the first three... Oh, this is volume six. Okay. The first three pretty much lay out the groundwork for the entire series. Right. Yeah, that's the hardest thing when you start reading a book in the middle of the series. It's always like you got to well, kind of. Well, fortunately, the Roadsman more or less stands on its own. It refers to the element to the events in the rest of the series, but it's rather self-standing. Now, the dragons themselves are, these are obviously, um, for lack of a better term, these are the dark forces that are possibly working with, the, with, with Lucifer um, and Well, the as a matter of fact, they were held to be physically begotten by a demon dressed up in a human body on human mothers. Yeah. And the mythology posits that dragons were originally bred by a demon out of the stock, using a combination of giants and dinosaurs to invent an entirely new creature. Right. And this is what the mythology posits. And that their father of dragons, a demon named Cornello, then invented a new kind of dragon, which is half human and half dragon. And they can shape change back and forth. It, it's, it's, they are uh, also black magicians. Some of the, some of the of concepts in the story, I think, uh, oh God, what a very famous writer used something similar to that. Um... In the Chronicles of Narnia, you see something similar. When the, when everybody talks about the children being the son of man, the the, the white witch just yeah was angry and always was angry at the kids, calling them you know because they were part of the son of man and she wasn't. Oh, that's right. Now I remember. It. Oh, Carol. Who was Carol? Thank you. C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis. Thank you. Okay, I made a mistake. Anyway, the point is C.S. Lewis was kind of doing the same thing, which was the dragons clearly are not, until Cornelio, Cornello, were not human. They were half human. They were half human, but their human part was... But yes, that is brought out in the series that the dragons... Because they are half, because they are half dragon, the dragonborn are regarded as demonic. Right. <clears throat> Gerald is because he is a Catholic, because he happened to be right. a dragonborn who was Catholic. Right. He, that protected sort, he's something him. Something of a sort of freak as a result. And that protected him from his demon father, dragon father. Yes. Because now he could go on the road, um, and. However, if he had touched a pentangle, he would have lost his powers. Really? Yes. Because, as I told you, a pentangle has become the devil's sacramental. Okay. Pentangles and magic objects, especially ones with especially magic connotations, such as the pentangle, are now become the devil's sacramentals. Yeah, that makes a great question out now. You mentioned about the kids. Uh, Which means that basically that the devil works by connection with them. When you use a pentangle, the devil may seem to flee. But that's because he wants to fool you into thinking that it's efficacious. I could certainly tell you that he, that this demon was not Seems Satan himself, and he fled. 
Yes, he wanted you to think so. That way he would fool you into thinking that the use of magic practices was good. And thus Let's put it this way. Actually, perfect. I haven't done much magic lately. I've been more of, in my work, I've been more trying to focus on watching what the hell's going on with the world and seeing it go down the shitter. You know that. Um, and um, even this year, I didn't really do anything with the weather because I felt that there wasn't really much need to stick my hands in there because for one reason, we already need, we have to rain in California that we need it. So that's what California needed was the rain and Texas needed the rain. Granted, maybe I should have stepped in. So you are an active practitioner of witchcraft. I'm a sorceress. I'm not a witch. They're the same. No. Anyone who commits witchcraft, sorcery, or any other such practices is ipso facto a witch. However, there's also a Because the, two, the terms are interchangeable. They all mean dealings with Satan. But I don't work with Satan. I work you with think Father and Mother God, which is different. No, no. You see, the trouble is, when you work with, as you put, the saints or angels in any way but that which is prescribed by the church, you are actually working with something else on a different name. You know, let me see something. Yeah. Um, this is a great topic for my channel. Um, some that it, right now, of course, Michelle and I both and we have to kind of keep this short because you got to get this into the cable 13 program, which only have an hour. But you want to be on my channel next. Um, we could do a whole discussion on that. But for now, Michelle, I think we should just table that topic because otherwise you're going to run out of room and you're going to run out of time and you're going to basically wish to God that you didn't go off on a tangent because I know you do. Thanks. <laughs> She's right. Okay, so let's try that. Let's try to do just that. Let's try to focus on the book. Okay, so you 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 created this book based on what you saw with the people in Winstead. And when you look at when, um, how the kids in Winstead were definitely um, not at all godlike or definitely did not act as saved um, as children of God. They acted as the, almost like uncleaned unclean because they haven't been received a lot of them had not received the baptism of of, of Christ's uh, passion and resurrection um, all through the series whenever anyone practices or any sort of witchcraft sorcery magic and such like they mm -hmm. always sooner or later find themselves ensnared by the devil there was in fact one of the characters named the witch in white because she used the holy names she used Jesus Mary and Joseph as magic practices right. And acted under the firm belief that she was actually invoking Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, but she wasn't. She found out she was actually working witchcraft. And she was eaten by a demon. Yeah, you said something about... I mean, the character Vicky was trying to explain that. Um, yes. What witchcraft was, because she was able to hear and understand the cats. Yes. Um, but where do you think... Um, if you look at the Winston, the peoples, I'm not, don't mean just a spiritual level, I'm talking about the whole town, the whole general malaise. Where do you, th what do you think is happening to Winston now? Quite simply, it's being invaded by witches, sorcerers, and demons, and demonic powers. Of course, the whole, country is, of course sense, the whole country is doing that. I sense a lot of despair. I sense a lot of despair worldwide, not just country. Oh yes, the gray fog that infects everyone. So many of us are really kind of looking forward to the second coming. I am, and I know Lumi is. You'd better give up all magic practices or sorcery if you expect to make it through the second coming. That I warn you solemnly. Well. I speak as a Catholic. Give up witchcraft, give up sorcery, give up all magic practices. I command you. But don't and forget that note, to I must one thing. This show. I cannot stay longer. I think you're done. Really? Yeah, I think we're done. That's awkward. <laughs> oh Christ! Yeah, that is weird. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah, okay. So, um, it is. You know, um, I do thank you for coming. And, um, and I thank you all for watching this, um, very awkward, um, interview.
Hey, did you know there's a lot more going on right now at our rate websites? Are you watching all four of them? If not, check them out. There's a list right here. We got three YouTube channels and one audio-only channel for your enjoyment. So come on and dig in and see all the stuff we do here at the North American Snow Queen Palace.